most locomotives are just metal doing their job, right? But the Union Pacific Challenger shows up like, surprise, I'm basically a skyscraper on wheels. Well, it feels wrong, yet it worked freakishly well. So how did a locomotive this over the top end up being completely real in the first place anyway? To understand the Challenger, you have to remember something about America in the 1930s. The railroads weren't just a way to get around, they were the backbone of everything. If America needed it, trains moved it. But the Union Pacific Railroad had one massive headache standing in the way of smooth operations, the relentless, unforgiving Rocky Mountains. Those mountains were beautiful, but to locomotives, they were nightmares made of stone. Trains struggled up steep grades, older engines overheated, wheels slipped on long climbs, and schedules fell apart every winter. Some engines barely survived the trek, let alone excelled at it. Something new was needed, something stronger, something faster, something that could pull massive freight through mountain territory the way normal engines handled flat Midwestern farmland. Union Pacific could have played it safe. They could have built a bigger version of what already existed, but they didn't. They took a gamble. They asked for a locomotive that defied the limits of steam power, one so ambitious that a few engineers privately whispered it might not even work. And yet, that ambition gave birth to the Challenger. Imagine standing next to a machine so large, the ground vibrates before you even hear it. The Challenger stretched nearly 120 feet, rode on a massive articulated frame, and carried a wheel arrangement called the 4664, two sets of six driving wheels, two sets of cylinders, and a presence that felt like a steel earthquake. This wasn't just a locomotive, it was strength welded into motion. It was power shaped in black metal, and it was built for one mission, conquer the mountains without slowing down. Most locomotives at the time had to choose between speed and strength. If they were fast, they weren't powerful. If they were powerful, they were painfully slow. They could pull trains, or they could chase time, but never both, except for the Challenger. This engine shattered every expectation. It could yank massive freight up mountain grades and then, moments later, sprint across plains at speeds that made other locomotives blush. A 220-ton locomotive hitting 60 miles per hour wasn't normal. It wasn't even supposed to be possible. And yet the Challenger did it, like it was a casual afternoon jog. People living near mountain passes described something surreal. They felt the Challenger before they heard it. The ground trembled, windows shook, and dogs barked seconds before the locomotive revealed itself. And when it finally appeared, it did not look like it was struggling. It looked like it belonged there. Its exhaust didn't sound like a machine under stress. It sounded like a heartbeat, deep, rhythmic, confident. There was a strange sense of calm inside the chaos, as if the Challenger enjoyed climbing more than any engine should. Ask the engineers who drove it, and you'll hear the same tone in their voice, a tone that blends pride, respect, and a little bit of disbelief. They'll tell you the cab felt like home. They'll tell you the throttle felt smoother than it had any right to be. They'll tell you that compared to other engines, the Challenger felt alive. It reacted quickly, handled curves with impossible grace, and stayed cool even on long, punishing climbs. Many said it was the easiest big locomotive they ever operated. And when something that huge feels easy, you know it's special. But here's the twist that makes the Challenger truly legendary. It refused to die. When diesel locomotives arrived, steam engines began disappearing almost overnight. They were retired, scrapped, forgotten. Yet the Challenger survived. Not just because people loved it, but because it was still too good to replace. It worked better than many early diesels on certain tasks. It hauled heavy loads efficiently, handled grades fearlessly, and stayed reliable when newer engines hesitated. The Challenger wasn't just a survivor, it was a challenger of time itself. Most steam locomotives faded into history with quiet dignity. The Challenger said, not yet. Some of them kept working well into the late 1950s. They weren't museum pieces. They were frontline power long after their steam siblings became scrap metal. And that endurance alone gives the Challenger a mythical aura because great machines can be built, but legends survive. And then came the part of the story that feels almost unreal. One challenger came back. Locomotive UP3985 was preserved, 
restored, and resurrected decades after steam disappeared from American rails. When it returned to service, it wasn't just a technical achievement. It was an emotional one. Imagine living in a world of diesel engines, quiet horns, and uniform shapes, and suddenly seeing a black steam giant erupt from the past, smoke billowing, fire roaring, wheels pounding the rails like thunder coming back from exile. Crowds didn't just gather, they swarmed. People lined fences for miles, climbed onto trucks, ran across fields, and filled bridges just to see 3985 fly past. Kids covered their ears from the sound, but couldn't stop smiling. Old railroad workers felt tears gathering in their eyes as memories of steam's golden age hit them all at once. The Challenger wasn't just a locomotive on tour. It was history breathing again, louder and prouder than ever. The Challenger also had a deeper legacy, one many casual fans don't realize. It was the direct ancestor of another legend, the Union Pacific Big Boy, the biggest, heaviest, and most powerful steam locomotive ever built. The Challenger was the experiment, the testing ground, the proof of concept. All the ideas that made the Big Boy possible, articulation, enormous boiler capacity, high-speed mountain hauling, were perfected first on the Challenger. Without the Challenger, there would be no Big Boy. Yet the most astonishing thing about the Challenger isn't its size or its strength. It's its balance. It did everything. It wasn't just a mountain engine or a flatland sprinter. It wasn't just a freight hauler or a high-speed runner. It was all of them at once, a locomotive that could drag impossibly long trains over steep passes, then glide across open country like it weighed nothing. How does something that huge move with such grace? How does a machine that powerful stay so controlled? That mystery is part of what makes the Challenger feel almost mythical. Over time, the Challenger became more than a locomotive. It became a story, a reminder of what humans can achieve when they decide to push the limits. A symbol of an era when engineering was bold, fearless, and unapologetically ambitious. It carried the weight of a country through mountains, storms, wars, and economic struggles. It survived the rise of diesel power and refused to be forgotten. And even now, decades after its creation, its name still makes people straighten their posture a little. Because the Challenger wasn't just strong, it was unforgettable. Some machines live in museums, some live in memories. But the Challenger lives in the space between, where steel becomes emotion, where history becomes sound, where engineering becomes art. And anyone who has ever stood beside a living Challenger, heard it breathe, felt the earth shake beneath their feet, knows one truth. It wasn't just a locomotive. It was the iron heartbeat of the American West, a giant born in smoke and fire, raised by mountains, and remembered forever by the people who saw it conquer them. If you think the Challenger was impressive, wait until you hear the stories of the locomotives that shaped the rest of America. Trust me, the next one might surprise you.